We live in a world that glamorizes and promotes the child-free life. And we've been seeing this for a while, that they, they really, that's what gets pushed, that's what gets promoted, it's what gets glamorized. There's a new trend now called dinks, which I didn't make up. This stands for double income, no kids. So it's dinks. And this is people who, again, these, these are people who refer to themselves as dinks. By choice, they're doing this. They, they say they're dinks. And they're doing dink dances on TikTok. And, and it's supposed to be really exciting because they can do whatever they want whenever they want because they don't have any small humans to be financially or otherwise responsible for. We're dinks. We're going to go to Costco and buy all the snacks in bulk that we want. We're dinks. We have disposable income to spend on whatever we would like and don't have to spend on a kid. We're dinks. I'm going to go to every football game and play 18 holes whenever I want. We're dinks. We're going to get asked at every single family event what we're doing with our life. But the same world that's promoting that image is reaching a point where in the not-too-distant future we as a human race will simply no longer be replacing ourselves. Okay, so uh, what is total fertility rate? It's the number of children, uh, average number of children you can expect a woman to have uh, if, you know, throughout their reproductive years, assuming they make it. Um, so uh, this has been going down in pretty much all societies. It's gone down really uh, dramatically in the most advanced societies. And we can see that obviously in a country like the United States, and you can see it in countries like South Korea and China as they become uh, much more advanced economically and educationally. You could argue it's good if you were worried about overpopulation, but maybe we shouldn't be so worried about that now. Now there's a, a emerging worry about underpopulation, about underfertility, that to some extent the dynamism of a society and its potential for economic growth can be undercut by having too low a fertility rate and not having enough relatively young people in the workforce, um, you know, that therefore have to support a you know, declining relative number of, of young workers have to support a relatively large growing population of old people. And that doesn't sound like it'll turn out well. So I think that is a real worry now that uh, we're undercutting, uh, advanced societies are undercutting the potential for economic growth uh, by actually uh, not having too much fertility, but rather too little. And that's what the data is showing everywhere. A large majority of the developed nations on Earth, with a scant few exceptions, are now below total fertility rate for basic population replacement. Scientists have figured out how many people need to be born each generation to replace the generation before. That number is one person per person. All things being equal, this creates perfect demographic balance. Since women are the only ones who can have children, replacing every person on Earth means each woman needs to have two children, one to replace her and the other to replace the man, who cannot have children. The total fertility rate is the average number of children each woman in a society is having. This number shows us if a society is growing or shrinking. In developed countries, the replacement rate birth rate is 2.1 children per woman. Maintaining this balance is of the utmost importance. If society does not at least replace itself every generation, human numbers begin to fall exponentially. The total fertility rate, or TFR, is set at 2.1. That's the rate of children per woman born that is necessary just to sustain a current population. That's not population growth, that number. That's just sustaining the population as it is. So that's not even growth. When a nation falls below 2.1 TFR, it means that the people in that nation are not replacing themselves. And there are a lot of agencies that keep this data, and the differences in what they're showing in this trend are slight. So you have Agencies like the World Bank creepily keeping this data, but I'm probably not going to use their data because a lot of it is from 2021 and some of it's even earlier. I settled on the United Nations collecting this data um, and also the CIA. They keep a world fact book, which has statistics about every nation on Earth 
broken out to very fine detail. And because they've got 2023 estimates, I'm going to be using their data. And then I'm going to back that up with UN data, which shows TFR and TFR projections. And I'm going to go through about 2050 just to get a general idea. So you can kind of see what's actually going on here. Because this, this isn't really being talked about and they're acting like this isn't a thing. Everything that's going on right now seems to be predicated on a world that is not matching up with the one that I'm about to describe to you with this data. So let's start with China. A week ago, reports came out that China censored an article about the country's plummeting birth rates for 2023, which actually marks the second consecutive year of population decline in a nation where rates have been declining. And this is despite the fact that the Communist Party reversed the decades-old one-child policy in 2016. It's still been declining. In January 2023, it was reported that China saw its first population fall since 1961. The population shrank by over 3 million people, and that's a trend that's going to continue. The, the one-child policy resulted in more than 300 million abortions, and there are reports that are saying that what actually happened was the, the country aborted an entire generation of baby girls because... The other issue is when they had the one-child policy, boys were preferred. So there were a lot more baby boys born than baby girls, to the point that their demographics are all skewed. China now has 30 million more men than women. So these are bachelors who can't find brides. And they're interviewing women who have two kids who are saying they're getting calls from government officials attempting to encourage them to have a third child. What a mind screw. I mean, this is the same government that for years was telling people they literally were not allowed to have other kids. They were forcibly aborting people. Fang traveled to a bachelor village in rural China with no women of marriageable age. She talked to people who had been pressured to be sterilized after the birth of one child, but then that one child died. She learned about forced abortions, unlicensed children who are confiscated by the authorities, and what it's like for adult children who don't have siblings to help share the responsibilities of caring for older parents and failing health. It's it's pretty atrocious. The one child policy is is a pretty atrocious situation and now after decades of doing that, now they're calling these women and saying, "Hey, could you pop out another one? We need to have more." Uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> you you spent decades traumatizing people in the opposite direction. You can't just flip a switch now and expect it all to change. It's just not going to happen. In China, family planning is not only a personal matter, but a national concern. Messages are broadcast over radio and the ever-present loudspeaker. The UN's medium or middle of the road projection is that China's population will shrink by about half by the end of the century. But the low projection, if things don't turn around, is actually less than 500 million. So this is what I mean by not replacing itself, not stabilizing. These numbers are all going to start going down all over the world. And so because of that, it's now being reported that India is going to overtake China as the world's most populous nation. But according to the World Factbook, India is also at 2.07. So they too have fallen below replacement rate as well. And I've done my share of reports in the past on the horrible, horrible, coercive birth control policies that were happening in India just 10 years ago, I did a whole in-depth report about India because there were stories coming out of, of mass sterilizations where they were just leaving women to recover from these surgeries out in fields. They're just dumping them. One man who was denied a rabies shot for his dog-bitten son unless he got sterilized first. While in Madhya Pradesh's Reva district, even the old have not been spared. These men, aged 98, 80, are being forced into sterilization by the village officials. I mean, it's very, it's very, it's been very horrific, some of the things that have gone on over there. But if you look at the UN projection data for India, the fertility rate is going to continue to just drop through 2050 every year. 
there were less than 800,000 babies born in Japan in 2022 total, which is the lowest number on record. By January 2023, Japan's prime minister delivered a policy speech saying it's now or never on the shrinking population of Japan. So in other words, if they don't reverse course and now, basically, the problem is going to reach a point where the consequences will be irreversible. In April, the government released an estimate that the current population would probably reduce itself by half to about 63 million by 2100. The thing is, is 40% of that population is going to be people over the age of 65. So it's going to reduce down to the same number the country had back in 1930. But the difference is is that the proportion of people over the age of 65 back then was just 4.8%. So this is a large, a, a large portion of people are going to be past working age. By last June, the government announced new policies. They're trying to promote population growth. Kids in Akashi get free medical care up to age 18. Families with two or more kids get free nursery school. Babies under age one get free diapers delivered to their homes by midwives, all regardless of income. I mean, they're just basically doing whatever they can to try to encourage people to reproduce. But on the other side of that, back in 2022, you have dystopic films coming out like this one, which sounds a lot like Dr. Emanuel's Atlantic article. Remember when he said, I'm going to live to age 75. We, why I want to die at age 75? Well, that's what this movie's basically about. It's about a, a Japanese government program where they pay people to euthanize themselves after age 75. And we've watched about half of it. It is really sad. (laughs) It's a really sad movie. I found a page on Statista, which is based on United Nations data, that shows the total fertility rate in Europe for 2023 by country. And all of Europe right now is averaged to be about 1.5 for the entire region. The only outlier here is the Faroe Islands with a 2.71, but that is the tiny set of islands which has a total population of under 55,000 people. So that's not saving. The Faroe Islands, is, it looks very beautiful, but it's not saving the day on Europe or anything. So all of Europe is below replacement rate, all of it. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute. Like, all of Europe. You have governments of places like Italy, Greece, and Poland, and others. They're offering baby bonuses where they basically cut people a check if they have a kid. In Greece, where the fertility rate is 1.4, it's projected that the population could shrink by a solid third by the middle of this century. And then 36% of the population at that point will be over the age of 65. They have a fertility rate in Italy right now of 1.24. It's one of the lowest ones. Officials are actually paying people thousands of dollars right now to move to empty villages in Italy. In some cases, tens of thousands of dollars. In 2022, births in Italy hit a new historic low, and they referred to the population decline as a national emergency. Germany just reported a population flatline in 2021 for the first time in a decade, And it's been reported that population growth in Germany comes exclusively from positive net immigration. And that's not just Germany. That's there's I'll get to that in a minute. But that's that is definitely not just Germany. Germany's fertility rate is 1.58, according to World Factbook. But the Federal Statistical Office of Germany put out a press release last July stating that the fertility rate actually fell to 1.46. So that's the lowest level since 2013 after the number of children born dropped 7% in 2022 as compared with 2021. And there were some pretty hefty drops in 2022, just by the way, for those paying attention, between 2021 and 2022. Denmark, which has a fertility rate of 1.77, even has commercials called Do It for Denmark. And and I'm not even kidding. Kassiks redde Danmarks fremtid. Danmark har et problem. Fødselsraten er den laveste i 27 år, og der fødes ikke nok børn til at forsørge den aldrende befolkning. Skiftende regeringer har ikke kunne løse problemet, men der må være en løsning. 
i procent af alle danske børn er undfanget på en ferie. Så for at hjælpe den faldende danske fødselsrate, vi spis opfordrer alle danskere til at tage på en romantisk storbyferie. Det hjælper selvfølgelig også lidt på vores fremtidige forretning. Men er det ikke motivation nok at gøre det for Danmark, så har vi lavet en lille konkurrence. Book din rejse med vores ægløsningsrabat. Før den af. Bevis, du har undfanget barn og vind tre års forbrug af babyudstyr og en børnevenlig ferie. Deltag i konkurrencen. Do it for Denmark. Meanwhile, Bulgaria, the EU's poorest state, has been projected to have the fastest shrinking population in the world. Losing a fifth of its total population since the 90s. By 2050, it is projected to shrink to half of what it currently is, down to 5.5 million. There's a UN report called World Population Prospects 2022 that says Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, Serbia, and Ukraine are all expected to lose over 20% of their current populations by 2050. And that same report, just by the way, noted that more than half of the projected increase in global population by 2050 is going to come out of just eight countries. Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, the Philippines, and Tanzania. Side note here, I just want to mention also, but the majority of countries that have what appear to be high fertility rates are also some of the nations with much lower life expectancy rates overall and much higher infant mortality rates. So having a high fertility rate doesn't really mean much if it's a war-ravaged country where people on average aren't making it past the age of 55, like say in Afghanistan, where they have a fertility rate of 4.53, which may seem high compared to basically everywhere in the West, but they're also the number one place in the world right now for high infant mortality. The highest fertility rate in the world right now is reportedly in Niger with a 6.73, but this country has the sixth highest infant mortality rate in the world, and the average man born there will be lucky if he makes it to the age of 60. So these kinds of high fertility rates don't mean much when you couple them with these other dreadful statistics. They're they're not doing well just because they have a high fertility rate. Asia's fertility rates are also well below. Taiwan, which is last for fertility rate of any nation in the world pretty consistently at right now it's at 1.09. Some places say it's even lower, has spent more than $3 billion in recent years on initiatives trying to encourage its citizens to reproduce. The LA Times reported back in October that officials are funding singles mixers, government-funded singles mixers, where A guy gets up in front of the crowd and in between thanking the government departments for funding the event says things like, you should pair up as quickly as possible and have kids as quickly as possible. So that's when they get up in front of the room full of singles and tell everybody, pair up as quickly as possible and just start spitting out kids, you know, which just sounds like a terrible recipe for parenthood and creating mentally competent adults, doesn't it? I mean, how is this actually going to solve anything? Just slamming people together who don't even hardly know each other to make babies seems like a terrible freaking idea for the child that's going to come out of that situation actually growing up to become a psychologically well-adjusted adult in this world. South Korea is second to last in fertility, and despite spending more than $200 billion to try to boost their population in the past 17 years, And despite spending $200 billion, the government cannot seem to find a way to encourage people to have kids. On this side of the pond, Canada has a 1.57. And just this week, Randall Bartlett, Desjardins Senior Director of Canadian Economics, released a report saying that Canada's population growth, which of late has been on the fastest pace since 1957, so they're having a lot of population growth in Canada, but it's all due to the recent waves of international immigration and a sharp uptick in what they're referring to as, quote, non-permanent resonance. In fact, this entire article here begins with the statement that Canada's economic prospects depend increasingly on population growth, despite record numbers coming in, and that closing the door to temporary newcomers would deepen the recession that they expect in 2024 and blunt the subsequent recovery. 
it would similarly lower potential GDP. So Canadians aren't replacing themselves, and the only reason they're having any population growth in Canada at all is because of immigration. And that's, again, this is what's going on with the immigration. So Canada's not replacing themselves, neither are Mexicans. Mexico's TFR sits at 1.73. The United States is not replacing itself. We're a little bit higher at 1.84, but that's going down. In 2020, the U.S. birth rate fell to its lowest on record, according to the CDC National Center for Health Statistics. And Australia's rate also hit a record low that same year. And they're saying it's the pandemic, but the fertility rates aren't going up. Birth rates actually fell all over the world during the pandemic. But in America, this was just a continuance of a trend that's been going on now for five decades. And that's what's happening in a lot of places in the West. And so if you go to the UN's data.un.org website and you look at their median projections, they expect the entire world as a whole will fall below replacement rate by 2056. Which when I was a little kid, I used to think the 2050 sounded like that was forever away. But now it's just a little over 30 years from now. So that, that's when the world on average as a whole is on track to hit population growth zero. Not just population growth zero, it's going to start becoming negative. We will not be replacing ourselves in the majority of nations in this world. So this means that the population, again, is not going to be stabilized. It's going to continue to age and decline. And it should become pretty obvious just by looking at this that using immigration to cover this problem is only going to work as a stopgap for a little while. China's population is shrinking for the first time in decades, raising fears that China's economy could shrink with it. Europe's population is quickly getting older, too. Meanwhile, parts of the developing world are facing a youth bubble. So could immigration help address both of these problems? Because once the populations of the majority of the world's nations begin to shrink, that's not going to really help fix it. The World Economic Forum was talking about this in a 2020 article where they mentioned that fewer people is good for the climate, but the economic consequences will be severe. So in the 1960s, there were six people of working age for every retired person. But today the ratio is three to one. And by 2035, it's going to be two to one. And again, it's not like these figures are just all of a sudden this is what's happening. This is something that's been happening. This isn't because of the pandemic. This has been going on for a while. It's been known. One of the first reports I did as an activist over 10 years ago was going on about these figures and how overpopulation was a myth and here's why and look at the math. Mainstream media continues to program us to accept population control and tell us the world is overpopulated as if this is just an incontrovertible Fact. They use broad, vague terms, throwing that out there. But if you actually go and look at the data, every industrialized nation is having either a zero population growth rate or even a negative population growth rate. But we're constantly being distracted by all this other stuff that's going on and all this talk of the environment and, and resources and everything. But in the background of that, this has been happening and continues to happen and is going to accelerate for the rest of this century and possibly beyond. They can drag Paul Ehrlich, you know, the, the population bomb guy, a guy who has been consistently wrong in his predictions for over half a century. They can drag him back out of his crypt to scaremonger everyone about mass extinction events or whatever. <laughs> Just to repeat the same line of garbage talking points he always does. But meanwhile, this is what's actually happening. I mentioned Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel earlier. I remember we did a report on him. That's Rahm Emanuel's brother who wrote the op-ed for The Atlantic about how he didn't want to live past the age of 75 because he says people don't really contribute much to society after that. And five years later, apparently in 2019, MIT Technology Review went and interviewed him to see if his opinion had changed. And he actually doubled down. And this is a quote from that interview. These people who live a vigorous life to 70, 80, 90 years of age, when I look at what those people do, and do is in quotes like he said it with derisive air quotes, almost all of it is what I classify as play. It's not meaningful work, he said. They're riding motorcycles, they're hiking. We can all have value, don't get me wrong, but if it's the main thing in your life, um, that's probably not a meaningful life, end quote. So. 
I guess in Ezekiel Emanuel's world, you're just supposed to become an adult so that you can work your whole entire life and then just happily bow out when you have no more work to give to the system. That's what it sounds like he's saying. It sounds like he's saying the sole purpose of your existence is just to work your whole entire life so that when you hit retirement and say you want to finally go hiking and experience the world, nope, that's not meaningful enough, according to Dr. Emanuel, who's quite apparently placed himself in judgment over everyone else's lives and how meaningful or not that is based on his singular limited perception of what defines words like life and meaning. And what's fueling the population growth, not just here in America, but in most middle to upper income countries is immigration, not procreation, period. This article from the BBC dated July 2020 admits, by the way, that countries including the UK are using migration to boost their population numbers and compensate for the falling fertility rates. Italy knows about this. They, they have a prime minister now who was a far-right prime minister when she campaigned. It was on promises to put up a naval blockade to stop migrants from crossing the Mediterranean. That was before she became prime minister in October 2022. But this last July, she just got done issuing a legal migration decree and estimated that Italy needs 833,000 new migrants over the next three years just to fill the gaps in its labor force. So I suspect that's a part of why we're seeing this influx of immigrants all over the Western world. Because if you look at the numbers in the Western world for fertility rates, the populations are not replacing themselves. And it's going to start affecting the labor forces, and it's going to start affecting GDP. And I just, this was known. It's been known. And it's <laughs> unbelievable to me. They were so thrilled to push population control. The Population Council's East Asia representative is Mr. S.M. Keeney was helped with the development of IUD programs in Taiwan, Turkey, Korea, India, Pakistan, Philippines, and Thailand. Ever since the time of the Rockefellers, the Harrimans, and the elites that started funding eugenics back in the late 19th, early 20th century, funding the eugenics records office, they were also funding plays, eugenics plays. So... Propaganda in a stage play format. They'd probably still be doing it, but it fell out of favor after World War II. Gee, can't imagine why. Aided by interested industrialists, by a wise government, and by their own educated choices, they are deciding to keep families small. The Population Study Center conducts an island-wide fertility survey, a follow-up sample of loop acceptors and coupon holders other studies which evaluate the national program. We hope that our expanding family planning program is helping in some way to accelerate this decrease in population growth. And now, after all of these years of pushing birth control and fear of pregnancy and parenthood, man, I remember, I think it was a Lifetime Network movie. It seems like that. I, I can't remember, but... Back in high school, they made us watch a movie um, with Molly Ringwald in it. It was an old movie, too. Ah, young love. It can lead to so many wonderful things. I'm pregnant. Can you pass the turnips? Like babies. Oh, my God. You are huge. And marriage. Excuse me, sir. Are we married yet? Really? Yes, really. And the whole thing was is that she got pregnant in high school and her and her boyfriend had to drop out to raise the baby and give up all their dreams, and they were living in some kind of ghetto apartment. Do you guys remember this movie? And divorce. This is my house! Get out of my house! But where there's a baby, Molly Ringwald finds out it's for keeps. Premieres Sunday, February 19th on HBO. And it made it look like their whole lives were just this pathetic, awful drudgery, and their entire life was ruined forever because they had a baby. And... And it was meant, I'm sure, just to terrify the crap out of every single teenager that watched it, that if you accidentally got pregnant, it was going to ruin your whole entire life. They were really thrilled to push that, that image, though. And now they're realizing that, oh, you know what? 
this is going to fundamentally alter society in some pretty serious ways. And you have governments trying to pay people to have kids. And I guess that's the weirdest thing and the reason I'm even bringing this all up is because this right here is seemingly not really a part of the larger conversations that appear to be being had about the future and how it's going to change. Spirit produced large donations for the newly created UNFPA, which thrives on an imagined crisis that has been both imminent and rescheduled again and again over the past two centuries. The truth of the matter is that every family on this planet could have a house with a yard and all live together on a landmass the size of Texas, which is really just a small corner of the planet. The population of Earth will peak in 30 years and then start to go back down. We're not overpopulated. Do the math. I mean, maybe it's because it flies in the face of the larger Green Agenda talking points, right? And maybe the Green Agenda is what they're riding on to fuel these massive changes that they want to put in place before this happens. But this this is what's going on. It really hit me when I was looking at all this data. And you can go, I will put links if you want. You can go look at all this data for yourself. We are going to have aging populations all over the place. And the, the impact of that on economies, the majority of the nations the world over is going to be felt because the populations are going to age. More and more money is going to be needed to take care of healthcare and all that kind of jazz. And there's going to be fewer younger workers to pay for it. The gross domestic product per capita of these nations is going to start to fall. And to act like society can just continue with an economy that's based on population growth, which is what they're doing with all this immigration. Like I said, Canada even straight up admitted it. This is if we don't have all these immigrants right now, we're going to have an even deeper recession. We have to bring people in here. It's the only way. Our our whole thing is depending on it, right? Italy saying they have to get over 800,000 people to come in to fill just to fill the gaps in their labor force to keep things going. So this is this is what's going on. To act like society can just continue business as usual with this kind of situation unfolding and it's happening sooner rather than later. It doesn't make any sense. So there's going to have to be real actual fundamental changes, not not phony cap and trade scam changes, like real ones. So we're in that window. And that's why I think you're, you're having all this with the Great Reset and all this other stuff, because they're outlining things they want to do in the future for their agenda. And I can't speak for everyone ever, but I know a lot of people are really tired, really, really burned out, feeling like cogs in corrupt, self-insulating, largely unrepresentative systems. Nobody I know wants to live in the world of Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel over there, the one he seems to be so enamored with, a world where your whole life is spent working, probably doing something you hate. A lot of people do things they hate. They, they don't love it. And they're doing that all day long until they're 75, just so they can then die because that's all their life is worth is whatever that work was. That's the only thing considered meaningful about their existence in that world that he's talking about is if you work for this system and once you try to have any time for yourself at all, such as in retirement, now you're not meaningful, quote unquote, anymore. So why exist? I mean, that's twisted. That is such a twisted, eugenical way of looking at the value of human life. It's also a rejection of the wisdom of and complete disrespect of our elders, just by the way. It's just bad. That is just bad. That is a bad system and a bad world. And I don't know anybody except the people who are benefiting off of that at the top that would want to keep things going in that way. And WEF is meeting next week. And I, why... Why do, people, why do these people keep talking about turning the future into a dystopic hellscape anyway? It's like they get off on it. Who elected these people? Once again, every time I bring them up, I'm just going to keep saying it. Who elected any of those people? Yes, there are some heads of state that go there, okay? But they're not representing us when they do, okay? They're acting like they represent us. They don't. No one voted for the majority of people that go to the WEF. This is exactly like what happened in the colonies when they were angry about taxation without representation, just by the way. Even if a head of state attends WEF, okay, his duty or her duty as head of state is to the people that elected him or her, not to an international corporate body of random business people that are getting together to enrich themselves. 
That's not that's not where the legitimate authority of leaders comes from. If they are going there and taking policy advice and then going back to their countries and implementing it and inflicting it on their people, that's a huge problem. That that is not representative government in any way shape or form. Last time I checked, Klaus Schwab is not president of the world. And King Charles over there may want to be, but he's not king of the earth either. There are no global leaders in that way. We don't have that. If you take the eat the bugs, you'll own nothing and be happy route out to the end of its logical conclusion. I don't think that level of imbalanced power dynamic is going to be super fun for people either. Klaus Schwab's life by subscription, quote, is really serfdom. It's slavery. Billionaire globalist corporations will own everything. Homes, factories, farms, cars, furniture. And everyday citizens will rent what they need. If their social credit score allows. The plan of the Great Reset is that you will die with nothing. And... They could be sitting around in a room talking about how to make the future better, but instead they're sitting around talking about scaremongering and a bunch of stuff that nobody wants. And it's it's really sad. It's pathetic. And but we don't have to do what they say. <laughs> so like, we don't. So let's not. How about that? How about we don't? And instead, we try to talk about having some other kind of future that's not this. We don't have to sit around as a is a world of people in all these countries and just wait to be told what to do by Klaus Schwab. Like, I don't understand why people are acting like that's the way things are. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't. This data has been on track like this for a while. This is not new. It's not changing. And nothing these governments are doing is really incentivizing a, a change that's going to matter to the numbers that we're seeing. This fertility rates are dropping. They're going to continue to fall. And either way, they're not going back up to the 2.1 that would be needed to even stabilize these populations. So these populations are going to start to drop. And once they do start to drop, it's just going to be like a downhill slide. So this is happening either way, which means changes are going to be happening either way. So what kind of future do we want to live in? Because I'm just saying, once again... It's not up to the people at WEF. Sorry. And we've already talked and nobody wants to live in the Hunger Games. I, like, I asked around. I couldn't find a single person. I was like, you know what would be really cool is if they broke the world down into districts and made us fight each other to the death every so many years. I can't find a single person. It's like, you know, Brave New World was such a great story. I can't wait until that's how things are. Orwell's 1984 sounds like the perfect future for me and my family. Couldn't find a single person that was like, you know, what would be really cool is if I could live in a dystopian hellscape where my life doesn't have to be meaningful. And once I can't work anymore, I'm worthless to the system. So I might as well die. And no one wants to live in the world that WEF is talking about. None of the people at WEF want to live in that world either. That's why they're still taking private jets everywhere, or doing all this other stuff, because they don't even want to live in the world they're describing either. They don't own nothing. They take private jets everywhere. They're full of crap. They don't want to live in their own world they talk about. They sit up in a blue room and talk about this world that sounds awful, and they don't want to live there either. So since we can all agree, including obviously the members of WEF, that nobody wants to live in the world they're, they're sitting up in their little blue rooms talking about it every year. Uh, maybe we should all come up with something better because <laughs> obviously things are going to have to change. But nobody wants to live in their world. So let's think of something else because we don't have to do what they say and they're not even doing what they say. The world sucks a lot of the time and I'm the first one to say it. I talk about it probably way more than I should. But it doesn't have to be, and I think that's why it bothers me so much. It's like everyone's just resigned themselves to everything sucking, and I've never understood why. Not ever since I was a little kid. It just feels like underneath the top layer of propagandized bullshit is the potential for an amazing world. A different one. I don't know, right now nothing is going to change until the people of the world stop seeing themselves as the royal subjects of corporations who sit up in blue rooms and blithely decide what kind of movie they want the rest of us all to live in. 
And I just, I just hope that whatever we do, it's something that maintains respect of the individual, which is something that humanity has struggled so hard for, for so long. Ideas that have been enshrined in documents like the Magna Carta, the Charter of the Forest, the Bill of Rights. This is hundreds of years of, of human struggle for basic inherent rights to be recognized. And I just, we do not have to go live in the, your life doesn't even have to even be meaningful, eat the bugs, capsule world, or whatever the hell it is. Anyways, I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. I would like to solve the puzzle. And now, a letter to the New World Order. Dear World Economic Forum, how are you? I know you're probably busy planning for next year's multi-million dollar elite shebang where you fly private jets that emit as much CO2 in a week as 350,000 cars so you can all sit around in expensive suit jackets with slacks of various colors to tackle your self-proclaimed goal of tackling the dire ongoing crisis of climate change and inequality by lecturing the rest of us on how it's our fault so we need to eat the bugs and be happy with owning nothing. At least you're really showing you care about inequality by paying all those prostitutes you bring in for the week a fair living wage. You're probably still assimilating all of this year's hard work on improving the world state, or I mean, state of the world, through public-private cooperation by shaping global regional and industry agendas, just like the ones that no one else ever voted for ever. You know, it sure must be cold up there in the Swiss mountains in the winters, but hey, at least you'll never have to worry about potential hypothermia. <laughs> Seeing as how five straight days of scheduled hourly ass kissing sure works up a lot of body heat. <laughs> oh, not to mention you have all that extra CO2 you've produced misusing the phrase think outside the box, which you could forgive us all for assuming is probably more than all seven plus billion of the rest of us combined ever could even if we tried. I sure hope you bring that one guy back so he can talk more about how we are one of the last generations of human beings on Earth. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Because you plan to engineer bodies and brains and minds. Engineer bodies and brains and minds. Then use all that data you've hoarded to become the future masters of the planet. Will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Those who control the data control the future, not just of humanity, but the future of life itself. It's a weird flex, but hey, you do you. Bodies and brains and bodies and brains and bodies and brains. They're coming to get you, Barbara. But bodies and brains and minds. Oh my! You know, I had a dream we live in a world where all it takes to rise to the top is a little hard work and dedication, and an annual membership that costs between $62,000 and $620,000 a year, plus a $29,000 event ticket each year, plus additional fees, travel costs, and at least five nights hotel accommodations and all that jet fuel for the private jet to go to Davos, Switzerland where one sycophantically kisses up to global corporate elites and pretends to be enthralled by how many times some guy in a suit who paid the big bucks to sit on a panel on a blue stage in a blue room so he could work corporate jargon buzz phrase babble into coherent and almost meaningful complete thoughts like about how in these unprecedented circumstances your team building has the bandwidth to pivot and move the needle to achieve synergy. You know, up to now, I kept thinking that everything science did was good. My training, I suppose. Now I'm not so sure. The same blue room where soon to be 21st century hereditary monarch, because that's still a thing, and Great Reset announcer Prince Charles. Systems level framework, global value creation, 
outlining responsible transition pathways to a circular bioeconomy. Who you all actually crowned with the UN goals, like the craziest game of televised dress up of literally all time, stood at a podium and said the phrase sustainable markets. Uh, sustainable markets. Like 8,347 times. Sustainable markets initiative. Sustainable markets. Sustainable markets. My sustainable markets initiative. Sustainable markets and markets rooted in sustainability. While you sat in the audience and pretended it doesn't make you want to fall asleep in slow motion like the van falling off a bridge in some inception level nether dimension of the fourth realm of the dream world your mind goes to to hide in because deep down you know you sold your soul to the tulpa of commerce the skexies of humanity summoned upon us centuries ago and you still aren't sure what you're going to do with your life if your god dies so the plan you came up with is to just keep trying to scare the rest of us by having a guy who literally looks straight out of white cat petting central casting for a bond film and even occasionally dresses like emperor palpatine tell us all how it's gonna be that we'll actually listen and go along with what you say Despite the fact that you all seem about as able to conceive of what the average person in this world needs as the average person in this world is able to catch a break from you control freaks attempting to micromanage all aspects of our lives all aspects of our lives and shape the world as the control freaks you and your handlers are just because you've flown in more private jets than we have. I know it was all just a dream. You still really creep me out. Sincerely, me.